Hello everyone, this is Dr. Dave Richardson. I will be your instructor for today's webinar, which is entitled Measure Coding of Medication Errors Part 2 Workshop. This is the second of two webinars related to coding of medication errors. Last month, I think approximately two weeks ago, I gave Part 1, which was a discussion of medication errors as well as a description of some of the general principles related to the coding of medication errors. And we spent quite a bit of time in that webinar reviewing some things that are in the Points to Consider Companion document, which has as one of its sections a section on medication errors. So the first session was about talking about principles and doing a few examples as well. And today we're going to do a shorter workshop where we're going to go through nine questions that are prepared to try to reinforce some of these important principles as well. We are scheduled for a 90-minute webinar today. This one I think will go close to 90 minutes, but again, I try to present this within the time frame that is laid out for the webinar and also make sure we have adequate time for questions and answers. Assisting me today is Hannah Eaton, who's the training coordinator with the MSSO. As you know, you have the ability to submit questions into the chat box. Hannah will collect those and at several points during the webinar and certainly at the end of the webinar, I will then field as many of the questions and answers as I'm able to address. The other point here is that we are going to be using the browser as well as the Poll EV application you will be using the browser to try to find some LLTs related to medication errors when we get to these specific examples in the workshop. And you will use the poll EV application as the, as the method for communicating your responses to me so that we can have some back and forth about that as well. Now, I always start out webinars with full disclosure, which is to tell you that as always, if you have some very difficult medication error verbatim coding question that you've been holding on to for a month, thinking that I will give you the answer to how to code that, that is not going to happen during the, code, the question and answer. Again, I think what I tried to make clear to you in part one of this webinar was that the whole deal when it comes down to coding is context and the context of medication errors is no different and sometimes a little more challenging because of the difficulty of the topic. But again, it comes down to a number of things, including knowledge of the product, the product labeling, the regulatory environment and specifics of your organization as to how one goes about deciding what is the quote correct answer for coding purposes. I'm just going to try to help you by directing you in terms of general principles. So I just want that to be very clear, because even though I said that last time, the question and answer period was just chock full of how do I code this and how do I code that. So it's, for me, it's all about just setting reasonable expectations moving forward. Um, I think that's it in terms of housekeeping things that we need to talk about. I am going to spend a little bit of time also at the beginning just quickly reviewing some of the main principles from part one. So even if you attended part one, these are the things that I think are worthwhile mentioning a second time before we actually get into the coding exercises that we're going to address today. So without any further ado, let me start moving forward with our slides for today. So again, I'm Dave Richardson. I'm a physician by training, specifically an adult neurologist and medical officer with the MEDRA MSSO, MEDRA Maintenance and Support Services Organization. And I am physically based in Annapolis, Maryland. So let's introduce the course. And I have some obligatory slides that I'm required to go through each time. This is to remind me to just say to you that METRA is owned by ICH. And because it is a living and breathing terminology, it requires maintenance. And the maintenance of METRA is the responsibility of the MSSO. The activities of the MSSO are overseen by a measure man management committee, which is made up of ICH parties, MHRA, Health Canada, and the World Health Organization as an observer. To the disclaimer side, the first bullet says that this is copyrighted material 
and ICH owns the copyright. And with the exception of the Metra and ICH logos, you can feel free to use this material in public presentations, provided you acknowledge that ICH owns the copyright. If you alter the presentation in any way, shape, or form, you need to acknowledge that you changed the presentation, and you should not imply or infer that ICH either supports or endorses the changes that you've made. The second bullet is legal, legal language, so I will read it verbatim. The presentation is provided as is without warranty of any kind. In no event shall the ICH or the authors of the original presentation be liable for any claim, damages, or other liability arising from the use of the presentation. And I don't believe we have any third-party slides in today's presentation, so I'll skip over that one. So let's talk about what we are going to do in today's course. In this workshop, we're going to briefly review the general principles for coding of medication errors that were discussed in the previous part one webinar. And then we're going to apply these principles based on, uh, to, to do some coding based on some case descriptions that I'm going to present to you. Now, full disclosure, I know that this webinar has been given by several MSSO instructors. Some have chosen to distribute the questions beforehand that's not a strategy that I particularly embrace. Um, a few reasons for it, but one more than anything else is I want this to be a fun learning experience. And I think sometimes the best way to do that is to show you these questions and allow you on the fly to start thinking about them the way you would in your job situation. I'm also trying to protect type A individuals from themselves. And what I mean by that is, some of these questions we will probably spend three or four minutes talking about. If I send those questions out to certain kinds of personality, personalities beforehand, those people may spend an hour or an hour and a half trying to find the perfect combination of things. And then I think sometimes the true learning gets lost in terms of just an approach rather than feeling like we have to have one correct answer. Because again, with the issue of context, that is not always the case. In fact, some of the questions that we go through today at the end of a particular question, you may disagree with the conclusion that I've arrived at, and that's fine. Because again, it's all about the context in which you view it and the environment in which you work. And then we'll conclude with our question and answer session. So that's what we're going to do today. So also you're gonna be using Poll EV just to refresh your memory if you haven't seen it. Also in the chat box, there are a couple ways to get the poll EV application available to you. The first is to go on and uh, the internet and either on your phone or on your computer and go to the URL pollev.com. When it asks you for a username, type in Medra174, M-E-D-D-R-A 174. Click join. You can skip over the next screen and then it will allow you to participate answering questions as I present that question on the screen. Second way of accessing Poll EV will be to use this QR code if you prefer to scan it into a tablet or scan it into your phone. So I'm gonna let that sit up there for about 15 or 20 seconds, allow you to pull out your phone very quickly and scan it if that's how you would prefer to have access to Poll EV. Also in the chat box, Hannah has put in there access to a temporary copy of the Metro browser if you don't have access at your desk or at your computer. And we will want to have you use this so that when it comes time for actual coding examples, you are able to go in and select actual LLTs out of Medra for consideration by the audience. Give me about five more seconds and then we'll get going. Okay. What is the problem with errors? And more specifically, what is the problem with medication errors? As we said before, it means, it basically, by definition, means somebody's made a mistake. And every time someone has made a mistake, depending upon their um, personal demeanor and level of comfort, they may be very forthright in saying, I've made a mistake or made an error, or it may be difficult to pull that information out. So when you are reading reports or narratives that are related to medication errors, sometimes what is remarkable is the information that is not in the report. And that's the problem with these medication errors. Sometimes they're not clearly presented as an error and one needs to look at it, assess the information, 
and try to figure out some other aspects to help with deciding how to code a particular event. I said to you before that the problem with medication errors is that they involve the three I words, information. The information, because it is describing presumably an error, may not be complete for the reasons that we just talked about. The second thing when you get a report is some assessment of intent. Because again, if someone does something intentionally, then it is not an error. So sometimes the report will not specifically say that it was an error, but you have to then look at it to try to make some assessment of what the intent was in whatever action occurred that you are considering may possibly have been a medication-related error. And that, of course, is interpretation. So the three eyes are information, intent, and interpretation. And these are reasons why medication errors are particularly problematic when it comes to coding with Medra. So let's quickly recap some of the major principles from part one before we move on to part two. Remember again that the points to consider document for term selection provides you with a roadmap of guidance of how to go about coding with Medra assessing reports, defining whether they are clear or not, whether you need to go back and query. And then once you have enough information, selecting the correct LLT from Medra, and again in quotation marks, correct, code as reported, and remembering only to use current LLTs. Now we talked about tips for coding medication errors. They were all pretty straightforward and we talked about them exhaustively in part one. You certainly need to know something about measure concept descriptions, and you certainly need to know that there's an entire section on medication errors in the PTC companion document. You need to be familiar with measure structure, its hierarchy, and specifically the injury, poisoning, and procedural complications SOC, because that's where these medication error LLTs are going to be found. You want to always check the placement of an LLT that you're considering coding to make sure that it accurately reflects the reported information. I told you in the last session that when we talk about medication errors, generally when trying to find an LLT within the measure hierarchy, a top-down strategy is preferable because unless you, in doing a bottom-up search, know exactly how something would have been phrased in measure, you will spend an inordinate amount of time sometimes trying to find an LLT. So top-down is generally the best approach. And just understand that sometimes Metro uses the larger umbrella of product to describe not only drugs, but vaccines, biologics, and drug device combinations. So sometimes you will not find a specific vaccine or drug term, but would defer rather to a product term. Okay, we also talked about a very handy tool that was developed based upon the language that's in the PTC document, companion document, related to medication errors. And there are three important questions that one needs to ask and get some answer to in evaluating these kinds of cases. One is to determine, first of all, whether it is clear that this was an intentional act or was it accidental? Second, who committed that act? And third, was there a therapeutic intention in what was done? And you remember that we said when you come to the determination that this was an intentional act, the question is by whom, if it's by a healthcare professional with a therapeutic intention, that is an off-label use. On the other hand, if it's a patient with a therapeutic intent, that is an intentional product misuse. If the patient had no therapeutic intention in mind, then that is potentially drug abuse or drug dependency. And remember that Many of the LLTs related to those concepts are in the psychiatric disorder SOC. On the other hand, if it's an accidental act, whether it is the um, had, whether it's been perpetrated by a healthcare practitioner or by the patient, if there was therapeutic intent, then that meets the working definition of what is a medication error. But we also talked about the fact that sometimes we have incomplete information that doesn't make it really clear to us whether it was accidental or intentional, or sometimes we're unclear as to whether there was a therapeutic intent. So we use the example that for the past month, she's been taking an extra pill at bedtime and posed a number of different 
scenarios as to why that might be the case, some of which could be construed as an error, others which may not be. Did she misunderstand the instructions? Did the doctor prescribe the wrong strength? Were her symptoms worse at night? Did the doctor believe it was more effective? Those are all different scenarios that might lead us to different trees other than medication error sometimes. So with that in mind, there are some so-called neutral preferred terms in measure that are not specific and are intentionally placed in measure for use in these kinds of scenarios. So in fact, when we have a situation where we're unsure whether an event was accidental or not, we can use terms related to the medical concept of product use issue. On the other hand, if it's unclear if this was uh, whether an intentional deviation was for therapeutic purposes, then we can consider the use of terms under the PT, intentional product use issue. And remember that these neutral terms in measure can be used in combination with other terms for things like misuse, off-label use, or medication error. The key thing in coding medication errors is to code as much valuable information as possible so that you actually have an understanding of what went on. So it is not generally helpful to code medication error as the sole LLT for a case when there's more specific information that tells you the type of medication error that occurred. And also consider that we talked about the whole concept of root cause which is why did this error occur? And if you have information about the root cause, it is very important to consider coding that in your database as well. Because the whole point of capturing these medication errors is to try to see if there is a fixable problem, something that you might change, the instructions for use, for instance, or how the product is packaged, et cetera, to try to mitigate the risk associated with recurring medication errors. So when we threw all of this together, it created a slight modification to our tool, which is intentional acts perpetrated by a healthcare practitioner, again, therapeutic intention, still off-label use. Patient, therapeutic intent, yes. Again, intentional product misuse. If there was no therapeutic intention, that again is drug abuse or dependence. And in a case where we're unclear what the therapeutic intent was of that person, that patient, that consumer, then we can think of terms under the concept of intentional product use issue. On the side of accidental events, whether it's the patient or a healthcare practitioner, if there is a therapeutic intention, this is a medication error. And lastly, if we're unclear on whether it was intentional or accidental, regardless of whether it was a healthcare practitioner or a patient. If there was therapeutic intention, then we would consider product use issue terms. Okay, so we gave you some questions in the, in the uh, last presentation to think about when you are evaluating reported information. I have basically highlighted the three that are most important that you should always take a look at, which is, can you tell whether this was intentional or unintentional, i.e. accidental? Who's responsible for it? Health care practitioner, patient, consumer, and was there a therapeutic intention? That's what drives the tool that we just gone through in the previous slide. On the other hand, there are other things to consider as well, such as at what stage did a medication error occur? Did the initial incident lead to subsequent errors? Did it harm the patient? Were there contributing factors? Were there only circumstances reported that could have led to a medication error? And remember, we had that LLT for circumstances that could have led to a medication error, although one did not necessarily occur. Was the incident intercepted before reaching the patient? All of these things are important. And we talked about intercepted and the way that Metro views it, which is an intercepted error is based upon when did the error occur, not when was the error intercepted. And that's important in selecting the right LLTs as well. All right, so let me just ask if there are any questions based on the material that I presented so far, otherwise we're gonna get going with the coding exercises. No questions yet. 
Okay, let's get going with coding exercises. So here's what we're going to try to do. We're going to code some verbatims. So for this, you're going to need either the desktop or web-based browser. I'm going to ask you to actually go into one of those browsers and find actual LLTs. I don't want you to just make up conceptually a phrase and type that into PolEV. I would like you to actually see an actual LLT that's within Nedra. We have nine questions. We have a little over an hour left to be able to go through these. So I'm going to be patient and understand that many of you, just like me, are challenged when it comes to typing. Also understand that we may be looking in multiple socks for some of these LLTs for these particular questions as well. Again, when you are talking about medication errors per se, and you're in the injury poisoning and procedural complication sock, understand that in general, a top down is the best way to go about this. You're gonna use poll EV to submit your proposed answers, and then we'll go over correct LLTs, or at least what I would present present to you as correct LLTs. Again, poll EV, two ways of approaching it. One is through the URL, pollev.com, and once more for about 15 seconds, just a QR code. Okay, let's get going. Case number one, this is related to dosing regimen. Let's read this one. The nurse was instructed by a doctor to administer calcium chloride to, an eight, to her eight month old patient. When, while preparing the injection, she mistakenly miscalculated the dose and gave the child 10 times the maximum amount that was recommended in a product label. The baby died five days later. Absolutely tragic situation. But this is what you have in front of you that you need to report. And what you need to do is look at this and try to figure out what is going on here. Is this a medication error? If so, what are the relevant and appropriate LLTs that one would want to capture? And in this particular case, we also have noted that the baby died five days after this aggregation of unfortunate circumstances. So I'm going to show you the complete list of questions, but we're not going to go through them with every single one of the examples because, again, some of them are not going to be relevant. But again, the first three are the most important ones in terms of deciding accidental or intentional, who's responsible for the accidental or intentional act, and was there a therapeutic purpose? When we start talking about intercepted medication errors, the stage at which an error occurred is key. This one I just want to speak about briefly, which is, do we have to split code? Now, if you read the PTC companion document, it will tell you that there are many times when it is suggested that you use multiple LLTs in reporting a particular event or code a particular narrative. And that is from the perspective of trying to be as thorough and complete as possible in giving the whole picture. But I always get pushback from people who say, no, we only get to choose one LLT. And I understand the limitations that may exist with your coding instruments or the environment in which you work or the data management system. We're really presenting these in an ideal situation where you have the latitude to choose as many LLTs as you think are appropriate to understand the case. Also, don't negate the importance of root cause because that's what this is all about. We don't really want to just accumulate 12 or 15 or 18 medication errors in our database without having the opportunity after the eighth or ninth time to realize, hey, there's a common root cause that we see here that we can do something to correct to stop additional medication errors from occurring. And then also remember this whole idea of whether a medication error was intercepted or whether the report is talking about the potential occurrence of an error which, which did not actually occur. So let's talk about that particular case and go through our decision making. Again, just to refresh your memory, nurse was instructed to administer calcium chloride to her eight month old patient. While preparing the injection, she mistakenly miscalculated the dose and gave the child 10 times the maximum amount that was recommended in the product label the baby died nine days later. Okay, intentional or accidental? Accidental, because what we've read here is that she miscalculated the dose, presumably not intentionally to do any harm to this baby. By whom? In this case, it was by a healthcare practitioner. 
the drug was administered for a therapeutic intention. And so this is a medication error. Now, the question will be, when we go on to Medra, what term or terms do we want to use to code this particular event? And with that, I'm now going to open this to you to begin to type in some responses of actual LLTs that you would think should be considered for the coding of this event. Let's see if we've got anything. Medication error. So for that person who said medication error, my issue with that is, is that if you read the companion document, it will tell you that you should not use medication error as an LLT unless there's nothing else in that narrative that provides some clarity as to what went on. There's a wealth of information in this particular narrative to tell you what might have gone on. Now we have accidental overdose, therapeutic agent, wrong dose administered, dose calculation error, accidental overdose, therapeutic agent, okay. Someone is coding death. All right, let's give this another moment or two. All right, I'm going to lock the responses and then I'm going to move forward. All right, so this was the verbatim as presented. When I look at this, I see a couple things that are worth mentioning from the very beginning. The first is the last line which says, the patient died five days later. Now you know that death, hospitalization, and disability are outcomes. They are not adverse events. So for those of you who chose an LLT related to the death, that would not be proper to do here because the only circumstance under which you would code a fatal outcome or death related concept is if it's the only available, available information in the narrative. And there is much more going on here in terms of a potential medication error and the circumstances around that error. So I would not have coded a death related term. But now we have a nurse was instructed to give a drug to a particular patient. And while preparing the injection, she mistakenly miscalculated the dose. Mistakenly, by definition, tells me that this was unintentional, that this was accidental. And what actually happened here was a miscalculation of the dose. And as a result, the child was given 10 times the maximum amount that was recommended by the label. The maximum amount recommended in the product label is Medra's concept description of an overdose. So this child was also subjected to an overdose as well. So in going into Medra, to try to be able to code this, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to open up the browser, and first tell you the first thing I want to address is this whole thing about dose calculation, the, the, the miscalculation of dose. Now, again, we believe this to be a medication error. And so the question becomes, if we're going to do this as a top-down search, we go into injury poisoning and procedural complications. And the first question will be, which of these topics, these HLGTs that we want to look in? Now, you can study this for a while, but I think what you would determine is medication errors and product use errors and issues is a good place for us to start. And when I start there and begin to look at the various topics that I have here that I can start to look in, I see accidental exposures to products. I see a number of things related to various stages of 
the uh, drug delivery process, the administration, dispensing, the preparation, the prescribing. But I can assure you, looking through these, I'm not going to find something that's really going to help me with what I'm concerned about, which is a dose calculation problem. Instead, what I'm going to land on here is medication errors, product use errors, and issues not elsewhere classified. And this is just me pointing out to you that how do I know to look at this particular HLT? My experience with Medra. And again, it's experience with Medra, even when doing a top down that tells you where you should start looking. Even if you choose one of these other HLTs, the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to spend 10 or 15 minutes looking for something related to dose calculation and not find anything. But if I actually open up that HLT, and want to see what kinds of concepts I have in here that may be of help to me. Eventually, I see a PT called dose calculation error. And when I open that up, I see an actual LLT for dose calculation error. And that is one of the concepts that I would like to hold on to because I think it's important. Now, the second one or second part of this narrative, as you recall, was the child was given 10 times the maximum recommended dose. So by definition, that was an overdose, and that was an accidental overdose. But I'll close this all up, and let's again go at this, assuming that we didn't have that intuitive sense of what we were supposed to be doing. So I'm going to again open this. I'm going to look under HLGTs. I'll go under medication errors, and then when it comes time to look at HLTs, this time I'm concerned about the actual administration of the drug, in which case I'll look at the HLT product administration errors and issues. And when I open that up, I am then going to see a series of PTs for my consideration. Now I can go through all of these, but almost from the very beginning, going down the rows, I see this PT for accidental overdose. And I open that one up. Now, here's an interesting thing that I noticed that several of you said, and this is one of those situations where I'm going to propose an LLT, but some of you propose something different. And I'm not going to say that you're right and I'm wrong or I'm wrong and you're right. In the choices that I selected, I selected accidental overdose. Some of you said accidental overdose therapeutic agent, and I don't think that's incorrect either. The whole point is, is that both of those LLTs are under the same medical concept or PT, which is accidental overdose. And when it comes time for data analysis, you would actually be looking at that PT. So it doesn't really make a difference which of those two LLTs you selected, but the important concept here was it was an overdose by Metris concept description, and because it was based on a dose miscalculation that was accidental, it's an accidental overdose. So I'm going to go back now. Let's close all this up and go back to the slides. and tell you that the two choices that I had was the LLT, dose calculation error, which is under the PT dose calculation error, and the LLT, drug overdose accidental, which is under the PT accidental overdose. Okay? So again, it's looking at it, figuring out what you think Excuse me, I, I just want to point out one thing. I misspoke here. Let's go back to the browser because this is important. When I was looking through those lists of issues, I did notice that the first one was, hold on one second. accidental overdose. That was clearly one of the choices that I had there under accidental overdose. But when I actually formulated my response here, I chose the LLT drug overdose accidental because in fact, 
that was even more specific because it mentioned that the overdose was related to a drug. So again, I'm not going to disagree with those who chose accidental overdose or those who said accidental overdose therapeutic agent. I just thought that the fact that the word drug was in the answer made this the best of the LLTs. Okay, so let's go back to the slide. So those were the two for question one. Let's go to question two. For those in the audience who are nurses, I apologize. It looks like we're beating up on nurses here, but again, most times in a healthcare setting, it is a nurse who is administering a drug and that's a potential spot for medication errors to occur. But this one says, nurse administered a dose of an antiarrhythmic medication several hours earlier than instructed. The patient was found to have severe QTC prolongation on his, EC, on his ECG. So again, got a dose of antiarrhythmic several hours before it was supposed to be given and it produced severe QTC prolongation, intentional or accidental? We don't really know. It doesn't tell us, but it does tell us that it was a nurse and that it was a therapeutic intention of giving this person an antiarrhythmic drug. Now, the other ones I'm not really going to address because they're not really going to help us with coming down to our decision tree of where we should be looking in the measure terminology. But again, intentional, accidental, or unknown. In this particular case, it's unknown. And it doesn't really matter whether it is a healthcare practitioner or whether it is a patient, but it's in, in this case, it was by a healthcare practitioner, in this case, specifically a nurse with an intentional or therapeutic intention. And so this is a product use issue. So we're going to go in the MEDRA and try to come up with something that's gonna help us here in making sense of this particular situation. So I'd like you then to take a few minutes, go in and start to think about LLTs for what you think should be captured in this particular narrative. A lot of thinking going on out there. Error administration. Product misuse. Kind of a general term. Inappropriate schedule of product administration. Product administration. I wonder if there's an even more specific term in MEDRA. Drug dose administration interval too short. Administration error. So we're seeing some that are very specific LLTs that you're recommending and some that are very general like product administration error. And then some of you are also starting to address the second part of this, which is the prolongation of the QTC. Premature start. Some of you are putting PTs in here, but remember we are really in the coding process using LLTs. That is what we do when we code. We're looking at the 85,000 LLTs and trying to come up with one that it is the most accurately reflecting what is in the verbatim. Okay, I'm gonna lock these responses. And then we're gonna go back to this, the slides. and go in the Metro browser. Now, let's look at this again. 
nurse administered a dose of an antiarrhythmic medication several hours earlier than instructed. The patient was found to have severe QTC prolongation on his ECG. So when I read this, the first thing I see is that a dose of drug was given earlier than it was supposed to. But what is noticeably absent in this discussion or this verbatim is, was it intentional or not? We don't know why this happened. We don't know whether the, the nurse was doing it for any of a number of reasons, some of which could have been related to, I'm intentionally going to give this a little early because it's convenient for me or because of an error in terms of interpretation of the order or whatever. But the second important thing is it had a clinical consequence for the patient. And so with that being the case, I'm going to then go into the browser again and start thinking about this in terms of where do I think I want to go for those two concepts? So first of all, the first thing I want to get at is that whole idea that this drug was administered earlier than it should have been. So I'm going to go into, again, injury, poisoning, and procedural complications. Again, we always go in there if we think that this is a issue that might be a medication error related concept. Having gone in there, we now see that that HLT still looms large, medication errors, but also understand that it says, and other product use errors and issues. So there are going to be terms under this HLGT that we don't know to be errors. They could be product use issues. And in fact, that is why we're going to start here. And when I do that, now the next question that I need to address is where did this problem occur? And it occurred at the time of product administration. So I'll go under product administration errors and issues. And when I do that, I'm gonna to have to scroll through a lot of different PTs, but once you scroll through them and think about it critically, there's one that I landed on that I thought was an appropriate response. Here is one for inappropriate schedule of product administration. And I'm gonna open that up and I'm gonna see a list of LLTs available to me. And of the list of LLTs that are available to me, here's an LLT for drug dose administration interval too short. And that sounds exactly what, like what was being described here, that the drug was given earlier than it should have been given, although we're not told whether it was intentional or not, that simply is what occurred. Now, having done that part of it, the second question becomes, what about this problem that occurred, which was the QTC problem? The QTC problem is what kind of problem? We need to know that this is an investigation term, and therefore, to find that one, we could go into the investigation sock. Now, we could go into the investigation sock in a couple different ways. We could, for instance, say QT and search, but then what we're going to end up with is 25 terms at an LLT level that we would search through, trying to find whether there is one in there that seems to fit the bill of what went on here was prolongation of the QTC. The other way, though, is if we want to do this as a top down is to open up the investigation sock and begin to start looking at places that we can find information. How about looking at the HLGT for cardiac and vascular investigations and then the HLT for ECG investigations? And then once we get into that particular HLT, we now see, see a series of PTs here including one of which is electrocardiogram QT prolonged. Electrocardiogram QT prolonged, which is right here. And when I click on that to see what the available LLTs are, then I arrive at one that says electrocardiogram QTC interval prolonged. So this one was top down, 
Whereas if I had gone here, I could have found that same term in here if I scroll through these 25. It's right here. And if I asked it to show me where that term is in the browser, it would have taken me right where I was having done a top-down search. So in going back to the slides, I formulated this one as two different concepts. One was the administration issue, and the second was the clinical consequence, and arrived at an LLT, drug dose administration interval too short, and an LLT, electrocardiogram QTC interval prolonged. All right. Let's do the third one, and then after the third one, I'm going to ask if we have questions on the first three. So let's get this one done as well, so we stay close to being on time. Patient missed doses as the delivery got lost and reordering took several days. Patient missed doses as the delivery got lost and reordering took several days. The first thing that I notice here is that patient did miss medication. But when I start trying to figure out why this happened, it looks like this was something that was not within the patient's control, that this delivery of medication, wherever it was coming from, that delivery got lost. And as a result, they missed doses of drug, and it took several days for the drug to be reordered, presumably then for the patient to have access to it. So, again, accidental or intentional who caused the incident was it for a therapeutic purpose these things are sometimes very difficult when we get a particular case like this because there are so many unknowns or so many variables here but let's look at how the ptc companion document helps us there is a section on drug omission and it talks about circumstances under which a patient fails to get a scheduled dose of drug and various scenarios where it could be that it was on the basis of a medication error and others where it's not for instance here's a dose omission unintentional where the patient misunderstood instructions or the device was jammed or the patient forgot to take a dose. These were unintentional situations. How about when it was an intentional omission, such as medicine was held one day prior to surgery? There are situations where it's unspecified, and then this fourth scenario here, which is called a therapy interruption. It is neither an error or intentional. It's due to non-clinical or external factors, such as supply, insurance, financial issues, et cetera. So in this particular case, because this is a question of a patient not being able to take the drug because there was a delivery issue, I'm starting to focus on that whole concept of therapeutic interruption as being probably the best choice here for the basis of this drug or dose omission. So we go to the browser and we're going to try to come up with some scenarios here. So I would like you to find LLTs for everything in this particular verbatim, as short as it is, that you think are worthy to be captured. Product availability issue, product supply issue. Missed doses, missed dose and error. Was there really an error on the patient's part? I don't think so. It's not that the patient had the medicine in their cabinet and forgot to take it. They couldn't get it. They were waiting for a presumed, let's say, to come in the mail. Or they went to pick it up from the pharmacy and it wasn't there because of a problem with delivery. Well, as I look at your responses, I think you're getting the gist of this, which is there are basically two things here that I would have been concerned about when I looked at this particular one. Let's move forward. 
the first thing here is there is this delivery issue that led to an interruption in the patient's therapy. And the second part of it is trying to figure out why did this occur? And it sounds then like a second issue, which is a product-related issue, which is the availability of the product for the patient. So the important thing with this one is we're not going to look for a medication error per se, because that's not the flavor of what we're getting here. In fact, when I open up the browser, I'm going to do something entirely different than what we've been doing before, which requires some knowledge of where to go look for things in Metro. I am concerned that what is happening here is an interruption of the patient's therapy, as we saw when we looked in the PTC companion document verbiage. So if I begin to type in therapy interruption and I go to search, I'm going to find several terms related to therapy interruption. But here's the important thing. Here's therapy interrupted. I'm just going to use that as an example where I say, where is that particular LLT? And I begin to go up the measure tree to see where is it? It is actually in the surgical and medical procedures. So again, for this particular case, you are gonna be looking in a sock that you may not have thought about at all. But let's do a top down going into surgical and medical procedures. And when I do that, eventually what I'm going to do is go into this HLGT, which is Therapeutic Procedures and Supportive Care, not elsewhere classified. I'm going to open that up. And then I'm going to find this particular HLT, which says Therapeutic Procedures, not elsewhere classified, and eventually find these PTs. Now, my interpretation of this particular narrative was that something happened where therapy was interrupted. And so I'm going to focus on this PT therapy interrupted. And that's when we get to a point of making a decision. The fact that it talked about the reordering taking several days, my interpretation of that was the reordering occurred or was going to occur. And then once the medication was available or when the medication became available, the patient was going to restart the medication. So therefore, of those two available, LLTs that are available, I would lean toward temporary interruption of therapy because I didn't see anything there that said to me that the patient had no intention of restarting the drug once it was available again. So that would be one of the LLTs that I would be concerned about. The other one, though, is an issue not with medication error again, but with a product. It's a product issue. And I'm going to look to see what's available in the SOC for product issues. And I have devices and products. So I'm going to go under that HLGT. And now the question becomes, what kinds of clues do I see here that are going to help me? So the first thing is I need to start looking at these HLTs and see if I see one that looks like it could help me. And here at the bottom is product supply and availability issues. And I'm going to open that one up. I see a PT for product availability issue. And then I see what? I see the available choices. There is none here that is talking about device per se. So excuse me, talking about a drug per se. So the best available choice to me here is going to be this one, which is just product availability issue. And so now going back to my slides, the two choices that I selected were temporary interruption of therapy and product availability issue. Okay, I'm gonna stop at that point and I'm gonna ask Hannah if we've accumulated any questions based on those first three. We received a question that you actually answered in your uh, browser demonstration about top-down searches. And then we received a comment on the second example um, where the intention was unclear, just saying, if we think it could be intentional, that's a legal issue for the nurse and the healthcare institution. So 
in as much as you raise the legal specter those kinds of interpretation I leave in your capable hands, and I'm saying that with a smile on my face, but again, it's one of the three eyes, interpretation of what went on there. Sometimes you would be more comfortable inferring something that I'm not willing to infer and vice versa. But again, it's all the context and what you feel comfortable with, because again, you may know something about your product that makes that a more likely scenario. And then okay. we have... Sorry, one last comment for the third example before we can move on. Um, yep. They said the product may have been available, but the process of ordering may have been delayed, um, e.g. the patient didn't find time to call the pharmacy. Possible. All I can do is just look at what's available, which is missed doses. The circumstances around it, don't know why something the patient didn't do, the pharmacy didn't do, et cetera. I don't know who's the culprit in terms of delivery not having taken place. I just simply know that the consequence of that was that the therapy was interrupted. And that's why I selected that one. And then in terms of product availability, in a generic sense or in a global sense, the product wasn't available to the patient, whether it's because they didn't go and get their prescription or they got to the pharmacy and the prescription was there because somebody hadn't ordered it. So I really try to confine myself to what I have available to me, knowing that if I get further information in the follow-up, I have the ability to always go back and change an LLT that I'm not happy with because I now have some additional information. So that's a good point. This third example has made, has added quite some more discussion if we have the time. Um, we have a comment that uh, for the last question, in my opinion, the LLT missed dose is closer to what was reported. In addition, the fact that it got lost makes me believe it's an error rather than intentional. We have someone who asked, why would shipping issue not be appropriate if the shipping got lost? Well, um, I suppose you could say that it was a shipping issue, but to me, I don't know exactly how it got lost. Um, it really comes down to you're talking about the product aspect of it, dr driving it around on trucks, et cetera. What I deal with is what happened to the patient. The product was not available to the patient. We're going to have an example later on where we're going to make the distinction that sometimes as a manufacturer of a product, one might be more concerned about what happened on the manufacturing side. I'm really kind of looking at this from the perspective of here's a patient and they did not get their drug. So to, to the person that said missed dose, yeah, missed dose could be used, but missed dose happens in a number of different scenarios. This one of using the idea of an interruption of therapy was very clear from the PTC companion document related to some external feature or, or factor that the patient didn't have any control over. In this case, a shipping problem or the pharmacy being closed unexpectedly, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why I try to follow the guidance in the PTC companion document and using the whole concept of a therapy interruption rather than saying a missed dose. Patient can miss a dose for a number of reasons, maybe even for their own personal convenience. They take, refuse to take their diuretic before they get on a long plane flight. That is a missed dose in that context. I'm looking at it more from the perspective of There was an external factor at play as to why the patient didn't get that scheduled DOVA medication. All right, well, let's move forward. If we, at the end, have some more time to bounce this one around, that's fine as well. Okay, the medication infused in one hour instead of over three hours as prescribed due to malfunction of the infusion pump. Medication infused in one hour instead of over three hours as prescribed due to a malfunction of the pump. Again, same questions that we're attempting to answer here. Sometimes they're murky in terms of trying to figure out what's going on. At the very least, we know that there's a problem with a device here because we're told the infusion pump malfunction. And then there's a consequence of it, which is the medication was infused more quickly than it should have been. Now, if we go to our decision-making tree, we're talking about intentional versus accidental. This is accidental, obviously, that this infusion went on longer or went in faster than it should have because no one intentionally broke the machine, the device malfunction. 
We're going to say healthcare practitioner because presumably this was an infusion occurring in a clinic or doctor's office, et cetera. Therapeutic intent, yes, they were getting a therapeutic agent. This is a medication error. Now, let's go into Medra and try to figure out which one of the available LLTs would be best in capturing what occurred in this verbatim. And it may be that there's more than one thing that you want to capture here, because again, we got a device problem at the very least, but there was the consequence as to what that device problem led to. So take a shot at that one. drug administration interval too short, but then others are saying the problem here is that the administration was too fast. So some of you are looking mechanically at the rate at which the drug is being delivered and others are looking at this the time at which it's being delivered. And these are the kinds of interpretive things that one person will focus on that another will see the same thing very differently. Okay, I'm going to lock and then move forward. <clears throat> so let's go into the browser and see where we, what we come up with. Let me just go back for a second. When I look at this, I see two things here. One is obviously this malfunction of the infusion pump, and the other one is that it infused three hours worth of medication over one hour. Now, again, it's not saying anything about what happened to the patient as a result, whether there was any kind of adverse event. In fact, some of you will say, wait a minute, you're inferring that it even got into a patient. And yes, that's an inference on my part, because again, my presumption is this thing malfunctioned, but it was not emptying drug into the ground, that it was being given to someone in the context of the device was being used to give a therapeutic if you, uh, infusion of medication. But let's look at what we can find here in the browser that helps us. So the first thing when I open up the browser is to start thinking about this in terms of, let's first deal with the issue of the device. And specifically, in this particular situation, we are talking about an infusion pump. So what happens if I go under product issues and I get to device issues versus product issues? I'm going to go with device issues because obviously we're talking about an infusion pump. And once I look there, I begin to see a bunch of terms, HLTs, that I can consider. Computer issue, well, I don't know whether it was a computer issue that made it malfunction or electrical or incompatibility or whatever. I see device issues NEC, and then I see something that I think is even more specific, which is device malfunction events NEC. And I'm gonna open that up and see where it takes me. And it takes me to a number of different kinds of ways in which a device can malfunction. And one of them is, device infusion issue. And I open that up and here are my choices. And of those, as I start to look through them, the one that I like most is pump over infusion, pump over infusion. Now I'm gonna anticipate one of the things that you're going to be unhappy with, which is why am I calling this an over infusion? Well, over-infusion can have two contexts. It could be either you gave more than you were supposed to have given in total, 
or you gave more in a time interval than it was supposed to be given. When I looked just from my reference at the FDA's guidance on things related to pumps, it just describes giving more medicine that was supposed to be given. It doesn't say whether more being defined as a larger dose or whether the dose was given over a shorter period of time. So to me, I was not uncomfortable with the pump over infusion concept being one of the things that I um, would have captured here. Then the second aspect of it is you have an over infusion of some product, but can we be even more specific in terms of exactly what happened here? And I think we can, because what we're saying is that the rate of infusion was faster than it should have been. And so then the question becomes, can we find a second LLT? And when I look, I again end up in the HLGT for medication errors and product use issues. And this one again, for me, is a product administration error or issue. And I'll open that, that HLT. And when I do, I scroll down and eventually I will come to a PT called incorrect drug administration rate, this PT right here. And when I open it up, there is drug administration rate too fast. And I think that's the best description of what the pump did wrong. It administered it too fast. Now, whether in fact the patient got more dose than they were supposed to, it doesn't tell us that in the narrative. It simply tells us that what should have been given in three hours was given in one hour, and so the rate of administration was too fast. Were there consequences for the patient? We don't know. There may very well have been an adverse event, but you do not code things that you haven't been told about. So that was where I landed in looking at this particular one. So as we then move forward, pump over infusion, drug administration rate too fast. Okay, I'm gonna move forward. Hydroxychloroquine oral suspension compounded instead of hydroxychlorothiazide due to similar name. The error was caught before dispensing. So it looks like two names, hydroxychloroquine and hydroxychlorothiazide were confused and it told us due to similar name, it does tell us there was an error and that the error was caught before dispensing. So in going through this, and we're gonna speed up a little bit because I'm looking at time and I don't wanna hold you much past, um, certainly uh, 15 minutes more than the 90 minutes that we're scheduled for. Intentional, accidental. This appears to be accidental. In fact, the word error was in the verbatim. By whom? Healthcare practitioner, presumably the pharmacist who's preparing this oral solution. Therapeutic intent, well, yeah, presumably this was an agent for it with a therapeutic intent, and then we end up with medication error. But the medication error did not occur because it was intercepted before it happened. So that tells us something about the type of term that we would use because this is an intercepted error, okay? So let's go to Medra and Browse, and I'm gonna ask you to take a crack at that one. Someone is saying, many of you are saying intercepted drug dispensing error. We're gonna to have to talk through this one because again, you need to remember that Medra defines an intercepted error as to not when it was found, but when it occurred. And this one was actually in the preparation of the medication. It was discovered at dispensing time, but that's now how what Medra uses to determine what type of intercepted error it was. Drug name look like, drug misuse. There's one other one that I'm looking for that I don't think I've seen yet. Let me scroll down. Up. Excuse me. Sometimes it moves faster than I need it to. Okay, I'm gonna lock. And let's 
go forward. Okay, I'm going to go on the browser. But before doing that, for me, there are three things here that are important. One is that a wrong drug is in play here. This was supposed to be hydroxychlorothiazide, but instead what was compounded was hydroxychloroquine. So this is a wrong drug involved in this scenario of potential errors. It was due to similar names. That's the second important concept as to why this occurred. And the third was there was an error, but it was caught before dispensing. And the actual error itself occurred during the preparation of the product. So we'll go back to the browser again, close everything. The first thing that I want to do is try to find the first concept for me, which is this idea of wrong drug. And for that, I'm going to, let's clear all of this, I'm going to go to injury poisoning and procedural complications. And when I go in there, again, I'm going to go to my standard, which is to go into medication errors and other product use errors and issues. And when I go in there, I'm going to then go further into the HLT, medication errors, product use issues, errors and issues not elsewhere classified. And when I scroll through this, eventually I'm going to come to a descriptive term, which is PT, wrong drug. And there is an LLT, obviously, which has that same concept, which is wrong drug. So that's the first thing I want to capture. Regardless of what happened here, a wrong drug was in play here. So that's the first thing that happened. Now, the second part of this that I want to look at is this whole idea of there was a medication error and that medication error was intercepted. So the whole point here is I'm gonna again go into injury poisoning and procedural complications. I'm gonna to go to my standby, which is to go into medication errors and look specifically for where did this error occur? It occurred in product preparation. I go here and I find intercepted product preparation error. And I open that up and here is an LLT for intercepted product preparation error. So the interception or the error is defined by when did it occur, not when it was discovered. And the error occurred at the point of product preparation. And then the third and final part of this was do I have some understanding as to why this occurred? And I do. It was because the names were very similar. And I'm going to look and see if this sock helps me in that regard as well. So again, looking in the usual place, going here, and then under the various HLTs, I'm going to see that there is one for product confusion, errors, and issues. And open that up. And now I begin to see a list of choices, one of which is the PT product name confusion. And I'll look there. And even more specifically, it says drug name lookalike. And I like that one as well. So in going to code this particular event, I chose intercepted product preparation error, wrong drug, and drug name lookalike. Okay, this one, infant accidentally swallowed some of his mother's iron tablets. Infant accidentally swallowed some of his mother's iron tablets. Again, accidental, this was a child, so this is a patient or consumer. Was it for therapeutic purposes? Hmm, okay. Let's see what you think. This was clearly not for therape therapeutic intention. Child goes and gets into a bottle of pills with no idea what they are other than they look tasty or attractive in some way. Accidental ingestion. 
for the person that selected accidental ingestion, if you go into measure right now and you look up the LLT accidental ingestion, it is non-current. You should never use that one. And the reason it's made non-current is because we replaced it with other accidental ingestion terms which had a higher degree of specificity. Okay, let's lock this one. and go back and go into the browser. So accidentally swallowed some of his mother's tablets, accidentally. So we know that this was not intentional and that the child actually ingested these tablets that were his mother's. Okay, I'm gonna go into browser. Let's see what we can do with that. First thing I'm gonna do is go into injury poisoning and procedural complications. I'm going to go into the HLGT for medication errors and other product use issues. And here are my choices. Now, this is an interesting one because again, we talked about all these things like administration and confusion and dispensing and preparation, et cetera. And we've been in this particular HLT forever. But how about this one, accidental exposure to a product? That's essentially what I think conceptually we're talking about here. Accidentally, someone got exposed to a product. More specifically, in this case, it was a drug, and it was a drug where the exposure actually involved ingesting or swallowing. So in fact, when I open up this thing, I see that I have a bunch of PTs, some of which are very unique in that they have a qualifying statement about the demographic, by a child, by a child, and this is by elderly person. So we had accidental device ingestion but we also have one for accidental device ingestion by a child, and that's important because children are vulnerable populations. So we're gonna actually look at this and say, which one should we explore a little bit more? And I like accidental exposure to product by child. And I open that one up and see accidental drug intake by child. That captures, I think, what is important in this particular verbatim, accidental, it was a drug, it was actually taken in. We didn't have an ingestion term that was also including the concept of a child. So I used drug intake by child as the best one that captures accidental, that it was a drug that was taken in and it was a child that took it in. And so going then back to these, accidental drug intake by child is the correct answer from my estimate. Now, let's move on and try and get through these last three and then we'll open up for questions. The COVID clinic gave a vaccination to an eight-year-old boy without realizing it wasn't yet approved for this age group. We have our standard set of questions again. We go through our decision-making. Was this accidental or intentional? Well, we believe it's accidental. It says they didn't know that this was an unapproved population. Healthcare practitioner, therapeutic intention, medication error. So go into the Metro browser and tell me what you think should be captured here. Remember, try to go for the most specific LLT possible. Excellent. Someone had chosen an off-label term. If we look at this verbatim, the one thing I would say to you is that by definition, off-label is healthcare practitioner and it's intentional. This reads to me that they gave it to an eight-year-old without realizing it wasn't approved. So I don't infer that there was an intent in doing that. Therefore, I would not be comfortable using any thought that this was an off-label use of this particular product. And several of you are talking about product terms and drug terms, but the other point here is, is there something that's even more specific in Medra that could be used? 
And that question then becomes, is there an actual vaccination term per se in Medra? So I'm going to lock at this point and we will move forward. And I'm going to look in the browser and tell you what I think. Okay, so the first thing is I'll go again into injury poisoning and procedural complications. I'll go into medication errors, looking for help here. This again is one where it's a product administration error or issue. And I look under that HLT. And as I scroll down through the PTs, I actually find a PT that is called product administered to patient of inappropriate age. And when I click on that one, I actually going through it. am able to find inappropriate age at vaccine administration. So I get the concept that it was an inappropriate age at which the product was administered and even more specifically that it was a vaccine. And I think that's about as good as you're going to get in terms of your choices. So inappropriate age at vaccine administration. All right, number eight. This is related to product monitoring issues and errors. And when we say monitoring, we are talking about all the things you're supposed to do before and after giving a product, drug, et cetera, to a patient. What should you know about who's a good candidate or more specifically, who shouldn't be getting a particular medication or drug? And beyond that, what are you recommended to do once you've done it. In other words, should, be, should you be checking CBCs and liver function tests, et cetera? So let's talk about this one. Physician mistakenly prescribed a drug for a patient which was contraindicated in patients with that particular genotype. So we're talking now about pharmacogenetics. Is there something about your genotype that speaks to why you would or potentially would not benefit from a drug or whether you would or would not be more likely to develop a side effect. So we go through the usual questions in trying to make sense of this, and we go to our decision-making. Intentional or unintentional? Well, we knew that it was accidental because it said that the prescriber or physician mistakenly did something. Excuse me, I need to go back. Physician mistakenly prescribed a drug for a patient which was contraindicated. So this, I'm going to have to make a correction on because this was a healthcare practitioner, not a patient. But yes, and therefore medication error. Okay. Go into the browser and tell me what you think should be captured here. So already I'm seeing people who are talking about a contraindicated drug being administered. But when I read this, I don't see any indication that the drug was actually given, rather that it was prescribed, as many of you are now correctly pointing out. But then the other question becomes, what are you going to do with that other aspect of it, which was the fact that it was contraindicated in a patient with that particular genotype? Are you going to do anything with that at all? because that might be important information to capture. Maybe the way you're communicating that recommendation or that requirement to prescribers isn't clear enough. And you could do a better job of doing that by pointing out that certain genotypes, this is a contraindicated medication. So I'm gonna lock at this point and we will move forward. So go to the browser close all of this. I do want to just point out to you that to me, two things here. There's a problem with prescribing error, and there's an issue here with it's contraindicated. Contraindicated where? Presumably in the labeling for the product. So let's go to the browser and see what kind of trouble we can get into.
I'm going to close this. I'm then going to look for two different concepts. The first one is a contraindicated drug was given. Let's work through that one. Excuse me, a contraindicated drug was prescribed. Excuse me, I'm about to fall into the same trap that I accuse some of you of falling into. Okay, so this comes down to now an understanding when we get into this HLGT, what kind of problem is this? This is a problem of product monitoring. You are supposed to know about how medications are supposed to be monitored. So there are two things, the monitoring issue, as well as the fact that it was inappropriately prescribed. When I start to look under product monitoring errors and issues, I begin to see a number of labeled problems here, labeled problems. And among that list of labeled problems is a labeled drug genetic interaction medication error. And we see two versions, two LLTs with labels spelled with one L and spelled with two Ls. But to me, the label is where it tells you that the use of this drug in people with this particular genotype is contraindicated. So that's the monitoring error that went on, and that's at least one of the two LLTs that I would have selected. I'll collapse that, and now let's think about the second part, which is easier and which most of you landed on, which is this was a contraindicated drug that was prescribed. It didn't say it was actually given, but the question becomes, where do we go to find that? Usual place. and this was already open from the last time, but product prescribing errors and issues. Open that up. Intercepted, contraindicated. So contraindicated product was prescribed. That's what happened here. It was prescribed. We don't know whether it was given or not, we don't know it all, so we can't say intercepted or whatever. We can simply say that it was prescribed. We're not able to infer that someone stopped it from happening because we don't know what happened with the dispensing and administration part of this story. It's not in the scenario as provided in that particular verbatim. So label drug genetic interaction medication error, contraindicated drug prescribed. Okay. One last one. The patient didn't read the instructions and left his insulin on a kitchen table at room temperature instead of storing it in the refrigerator. The patient didn't read the instructions, left the insulin on the table at room temperature instead of storing it in the refrigerator. Decision making. Intentional or accidental. Not being able to read or if you're failing to read is not intentional, it's accidental because presumably if they had read it and understood that they were supposed to store it in the refrigerator, they would not have done something to harm themselves. These two are mixed. I see what happened. Those two slides were probably mixed up because this was the patient this time around. Therapeutic intent, medication, medication error. So I just need to flip this one with the previous one if you see what I'm saying because the one that said patient should have been healthcare practitioner and the other way around. Got it, okay. So we know that we're dealing here with a problem that is related to what the patient did. I want you to go into the browser and tell me what you think. Patient or a drug stored in wrong location. Well, that's true, but the question is, is there a concept and measure that is even more specific in terms of what the implication of putting it in the wrong place was? And in this case, it should have been refrigerated and it wasn't. So not only was it in the wrong place, but it was in a place that allowed it to be warmer than it should have been. All right, I'm gonna stop, lock, and we'll move forward.
Now, the reason we show this one is because this comes up all the time about these things with storage of products. And we talk about this concept of medication use system, and that's key here. The medication use system is the system in which a patient could presumably have access to the product. So in a practical sense, the medication use system goes into play when a patient could show up at a location and either have administered to them or walk out with a medication. So this could be the pharmacy if you go in and can take an off-the-counter, over-the-counter medication off the shelf. It could be if you go into the pharmacy with your prescription and get your prescription drug. It could be at your clinic. It could be at your doctor's office. It could be at a health fair where they're giving out vaccinations or some other kind of medication there. So once it's in that environment, then it has the potential to be a medication error if the product is not handled properly. On the other hand, prior to that, when it's in the hands of the manufacturer, the wholesaler, the distributor, anything they do wrong is not captured as a medication error. And so that's important here. This was in the hands of a patient. So it is presumably now a situation where it is a medication error if we believe that that is the appropriate term. And so what we're going to do now is go into the browser and for this last one, try to figure out where we would go. I think this is a medication error. So again, I'm going here and I'm going here. And now I've got a list of places where I can go, including product storage errors and issues in the product use system or medication use system, as I described it to you. When I open this up, I get a bunch of PTs, including product storage error. And when I open those, I now see a list of terms, including one that says what? Product storage error, temperature too high. That's the LLT that I like. Now, this is within the product use system. For those of you who are saying, well, where would I find terms when it has something to do with the wholesaler or the distributor or the manufacturer? You go into product use issues. And that's where you see a series of terms related to product distribution and storage issues that you would use as appropriate. So even if the distributor drops the box of medication on the pharmacy steps when the pharmacy is closed, the pharmacy has not taken possession and had the, availability, had the ability to properly store that product. And so still, it is not a medication error by this cutoff that we use. Once the pharmacist takes that box inside, and if they refuse or fail to properly refrigerate or do whatever needs to be done, then it could potentially be a medication error because in the product, it's in the product use system. If the pharmacist opens this up and there's some kind of you know, fancy gadget inside that says sometime in the last 20 days this medication has gotten too warm, then by definition that's an error that occurred outside of their possession and it's under these product issues rather than a medication error per se. So that's an important distinction and a reason that we show that last one. So product storage error temperature too high. So what did we do? We reviewed some of the general principles for coding with medication errors, and we performed several coding exercises applying these principles. Now, as I said to you in the presentation two weeks ago, this topic of medication errors is an ugly topic. And what I mean by that is the companion document has 25 pages worth of material on it. And you will have to read through it carefully and understand the context of your drug, your labeling, your regulatory environment to really have an idea sometimes of what's the right, as in quotation marks, correct medication error code to choose if it even was a medication error. And so that's why I said we would probably disagree on several things here because you may be viewing it from the view of the context of your drug. But we made an attempt here just to point out some of the key things that you need to be thinking about. What makes an intercepted error? How do we decide what stage is important? Whether it's intentional or not intentional? Was it a patient? Was it a healthcare practitioner? 
all those things that we went through. Those are the key things and why this is such a complex topic to deal with. So at this point, I'm going to show you the contact information on those two slides for everything from how to send emails to the help desk, to the website, to accessing the browser, to where you find the support documents, including the companion document. And I'm going to thank you for your attention during the last 90 plus minutes, and then ask Hannah about questions that we've accumulated. All right, we'll go back to uh, questions we got uh, during example four. Um, the first one asks, is a device dispensing error an error of drug dispensing, or could it mean that the wrong device was distributed? You should never confuse a device with a drug. So the whole point here is, is that we make a distinction in measure between device issues and product issues. So you are talking about then dispensing the wrong device versus dispensing the wrong drug. At the very least, the first thing you want to do is to make sure you look under the right category within Medra to decide whether this is a device issue or whether it is a drug issue. When you start talking about device-drug combinations, it becomes much, much trickier. And rather than give you some prescriptive one-size-fits-all answer, I would suggest that you as a company, if you're involved with drug device combinations decide how you want to characterize those kinds of situations. If you had any doubt on what you should do, my advice also is if you can get clear direction from your regulators as to what they want you to do, then you should seek it out. I no longer actively work in industry, but when I did work in industry, I always considered regulators to be an important source of information, and I didn't shy away from asking questions of them. The alternative, which was to assume something and then later on find out that it was not what was wanted or was not what was expected, is far more problematic. And that's why I got out of that habit of avoiding necessary conversation very early on. Next question. Our next question asks for that same case four, um, why wouldn't drug delivery system malfunction be a closer verbatim match instead of pump over infusion? I think that the key thing here, let me pull that one up again so we see it, is just repeat that question for me again, Hannah, because I think I heard the word device. Go ahead. It is, why wouldn't drug delivery system malfunction be a closer verbatim match instead of pump over infusion? Because I think the concept of pump is more specific and is actually included in the verbatim. It doesn't describe it as a drug delivery system. It describes it as an infusion pump. Perfect. Next question. Our next question asks, uh, doesn't the red box mean a PT is discontinued? It does not mean that a PT is discontinued. You're confusing LLTs with PTs. I'm going to open up the browser. I'm going to show you this. We'll go on to cardiac disorders. I'll go under coronary artery disorders. And we're going to see two things here. I'm going to go into chest pain. And I'm going to show you something under, excuse me, I'm going to show you under ischemic coronary artery disorders. I'm going to open up myocardial infarction. And I'm going to show you one, two, three LLTs in red. That's how you know that an LLT is non-current and therefore shouldn't be used. On the other hand, when we're talking about PTs, and again, I'll use that same example again, you're going to see that, L, or that PTs can have blue boxes around them, green boxes around them, and red boxes around them. When a PT has a blue box around it, it means that you are looking at that multi-axial PT in its primary sock. If it has a green box around it, then you know that you're looking at a multi-axial PT and you're looking at it in one of its secondary socks. And if you see a PT that has a red box around it, 
you are looking at that PT in the only place that you're going to find it in Metra. And therefore, when you go into a single axial site like investigations, all of the PTs in that particular sock are going to have a red box around them. So to the questioner, if you go up here to Legends, this explains what you're seeing when you look in the Metra hierarchy. Blue box, multi-axial PT, you're looking in a primary sock. Green box, multi-axial PT, you're looking in a secondary sock. Red box around a PT means you're looking at that PT in the only sock that it appears. And a red box around LLT in red is a non-current LLT. So you confused red with PT with red with LLT. This means non-currency. This means single axial. Other questions? Our next question came in during uh, case number eight, and it asks, how would you know if the how would you know if the drug label issue? We don't know that the drug was labeled inappropriately. The report says, the physician mistakenly prescribed a drug for a patient who was con which was contraindicated in patients with that particular genotype. So that tells me, having been a practicing physician, how do I know how to use a drug? I look at the prescribing information, the labeling for the drug, the package insert, the package leaflet, goes by various names. But this is where I look to see what I'm supposed to do when giving that drug. And presumably the label for this product says this drug is contraindicated in patients with, and it describes what the genotype is. And because the label tells me when a drug is contraindicated because of one of these potential interactions, that's why I chose the LLT labeled drug genetic interaction medication error, because that would be the source, the product label, where I would have known that I should not have used that particular medication if I had ascertained that patient had that genotype. Other questions? I think this is our last question at the moment, and it goes all the way back to case number three. Um, at about kind of the search logic, and they said, would it work for us to search for interruption, then PT product supply issue, LLT drug supply chain interruption, then a product supply issue, and then temporary interruption of therapy LLT? That's a lot in that question. <laughs> the answer to the question is, if it got you to the right answer, then whatever you suggested just now sounds perfectly fine to me. I just looked at this from the perspective of I knew from my familiarity with the points to consider companion document that when we start talking about an inability to take a medication as prescribed, which is based on some external factor, like patient ran out of money and couldn't afford their medication, or the pharmacy flooded and when you went to pick up your prescription, the pharmacy was closed, that those are described as therapy interruptions. It makes it even easier to use the term temporary interruption if you can definitively see in the verbatim that it says the pharmacy was closed for six days and the patient missed six days of therapy before it could be restarted. Then you feel even more comfortable saying temporary interruption as opposed to therapy interruption. But to my reading of this, I saw nothing in here that suggested that when the drug is available again and that reordering was actually put in place, which allowed me to at least interpret this to say the patient wanted the drug because they're still trying to reorder it, that temporary interruption. How you actually get to that is part of the magic of Medra, which is, is a top-down search, having some idea where you should be looking for that particular concept. In other words, knowing what sock to look in, because if you try to do this as a bottom-up and you don't know to put in a term like interruption, you won't find it going by that route. So that's how you have to have some idea of where to go. You would need to know that the temporary interruption 
is in fact a surgical and medical procedure term in that SOC. That's familiarity with the PTC for term selection. Perfect. Any other questions? And our final question is just if you could please show on the website um, where they can find the points to consider companion document. Absolutely. So let's go to the website. So here is the website. And if I go to how to use under support documentation, it'll take me to this page. And the support documentation page has a blue banner up here that says points to consider documents. And if I click the arrow to expand that, it's showing me all of the PTC documents here in various formats. So here's the term selection PTC. Here's the data retrieval and presentation PTC. And here is the companion document, which I can open up here. And you will see that it has a section on data quality. It has this section on medication errors, and it has a section on product quality issues. And as I said to you, the one on medication errors is 25 pages long, but it is in your best interest if you do a lot or have the potential to have to do a lot with medication errors that you know what this thing says. For instance, telling you that you shouldn't use just a simple LLT medication error for all of your cases. You need to do a little detective work because this would be the equivalent of, if you don't do any detective work, 30% of the cases in your database would be medication error that doesn't provide a glimpse of what's going on. That would be like having 30% of your database just say adverse event. Your job is to look at the 85,000 LLTs that do provide more information. So it's got all kinds of things in here about potential errors, all the things that went into building that tool coding the root cause if we're aware of what the root cause was, and then a series of examples of various scenarios of whether it's a medication error or not and what would be the proper LLTs, and this goes on for 25 pages. So that's on the Medra website under support documentation. Someone Any other has questions? asked um, when the updated companion document would be published, or will there be an updated companion document? We only update the companion document when there's new information added. So, in fact, when we look at this document in its entirety, if we find that there are major changes or things that have changed or we need to clarify a point, then we would consider then an update. But the PTC companion document is not typically updated with the same regularity as, let's say, the term selection. Very rarely is there not a release of MEDRA, at least when we do the major update in March, where something needs to be changed in either term selection or data retrieval and presentation. It's not that often necessarily with the companion document. It's going to be driven by need of practical problems or ambiguities or errors in a document that we become aware of that become problematic. So in other words, if we find you know, a grammatical problem, not a big enough issue to redo the entire document and translate it you know, and all the things that go along with it. But if conceptually something changes where an error is occurring in the quality or correctness of the information, then certainly we make changes to the companion document when appropriate. Any other questions? That seems to have been our last one. Well, again, I want to thank you for your cooperation and your um, participation in what is a difficult topic. I'm the first to admit it. It's one of my least favorite webinars just from the perspective of I can be far more dogmatic and definitive in the things that I say for some of the other coding topics, et cetera. But medication errors is very, very tricky because, again, it is fundamentally flawed by virtue of the fact that sometimes because there's an error hidden in there, it is sometimes hard to get all the facts that you need to make a good coding decision. So unless anything else has come in at the last minute, I want to thank Hannah for her assistance today. Thank you for your time and participation. I would encourage you to attend other major webinars and also be aware of the fact that we're beginning face-to-face -face training on a limited basis as the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is allowing us to and just look on the Medra training site for information on that as well.
And if nothing else has come in, this is Dr. Dave Richardson, and I'm going to sign off from today's webinar.